Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this, the fourth Sunday of Easter, Good Shepherd Sunday, one of my favorite Sundays in the church year, because the imagery of Good Shepherd and me being a lamb or a sheep, and being in the flock or not being in the flock, the Lord is still the Good Shepherd, uh, comes from um, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, where Jesus tells this parable, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country? I think that's interesting. They're kind of vulnerable out there. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that detail. I thought, well, he left them back in the pen where they're safe. No, he leaves them out in the field where they're vulnerable. Where they're vulnerable because he's so concerned about the one that's lost, who's even more vulnerable. Okay, and goes after the one that is lost until he finds it. Until he finds it, not if he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. That's the end of the parable, and Jesus said, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven. Parable always has one point. And most of the parables in the Bible, uh, Jesus doesn't give the point. You figure it out for yourself. But in this parable, Jesus does. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one not sheep, but one sinner, a single sinner who repents, than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance or those that are already in the fold. Now, I like, I switch this from the traditional Good Shepherd um, gospel which always comes from John chapter 10 where Jesus says I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd know uh, the sheep knows his voice his voice and they follow him and John chapter 10 goes on and says and there's a there are bad shepherds so um, the, the predators there are predators and they'll try to t take away the sheep and uh, get them out of the corral or t open a false gate okay and Jesus says, I am the good shepherd uh, there. So, but I chose this one because it couches this metaphor of Jesus as the shepherd, which in a way is kind of archaic. We, um, <coughs> we don't have a lot. Anybody here a shepherd for a pastime? No. Maybe you're a rancher. That comes close. You have cattle and livestock. That comes close. But the uh, image of a shepherd is a little bit archaic, but still we can identify with it because we know we know what sheep are. We know they're kind of cuddly and they're cute. And they're valuable. The, uh, they're shorn for their, for their uh, wool. 4-H uh, students uh, uh, groom sheep and take them to the 4-H shows and get ribbons. And, and it teaches cultural uh, uh, nurturing skills and uh, things, things like that. And um, we know we need nurturing. We all need nurturing, whether we're just turning 11 or 9 or 99, uh, we need nurturing. We need someone to take care of us. And Jesus says, I am that shepherd. But I like, I like this uh, image of sheep because it does it kind of in mathematical terms. And uh, Luke 15, uh, Jesus tells two other parables, and they all have to do with percentages. Here it's one sheep lost out of 100. What percentage is that? 1%. 1%. The next parable is a lady who has 10 coins and she loses one of them. What percent is that? 10%. And the th third and final parable, the longest in uh, this chapter of lostness, okay, lost sheep, lost coin, is a lost son. And there are two sons, so what percentage of the family is lost? 50%. Okay, so it's kind of math. So this morning we're going to talk a little bit about numbers and s I call it biblical math. Biblical math. Now my son Peter is a math teacher. Where he got that I know not. If someone says, Gary, how much money do you have in your bank account? I'll say not very much. That's not a mathematical term. Okay. $99.46 would be a mathematical term. Peter is that kind of guy. I called him up this week when we got home, and I said, I'm doing a sermon called Biblical Math. Can you give me a few math riddles so I could get the people to start thinking about math and about numbers? He, he said, sure, you want them hard or easy? Guess what I said? Yes. What? 
they're not. <laughs> Here's the first one. What is the digit used most between one and a thousand? What single digit? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is the digit most used between one and what's the least used? I didn't know. So, so I asked him. He said one is the most used and zero is the least used. Now this next one I, that he told, did you get it right? Oh yeah, tell me. You're just saying that. The next one I knew how to figure it out, but I wasn't going to take the time to figure it out. He says, what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus blah, 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 plus 98 plus 99 plus 100? What's the so sum total of that? And I said, tell me. <laughs> because I'm not going to add up all those numbers. And he says, it's easy, Dad. It's easy, Dad. You just take 1 plus 99. You go to the end of the spectrums, and you start this way. 1 and 99 is 100. 2 and 98 is 100. You go all that way to 49, you have 4,900. You have 50 in the middle, that's 4,950, and you have 100 at the end. The answer is 5,050. You're just like me, I can tell. <laughs> then he gave me this one. I think he was trying to be relevant, and I think he was kind of despairing that we get any of these. He goes, if Peter, that's his, his name is Peter. I was kind of proud of him because he made this really relevant. If Peter gives $7 to Grace Church, he knows the church I'm working at. Smart kid. If Peter gives $7 to Grace Church and God gives him eight and he puts in nine and God gives him 10, how much money does Peter have? You won't like this answer. It's not a mathematical answer. He said, it depends upon how you view, view the world. I said, Peter, I don't like that one. <laughs> there's a biblical math. There's Peter's math, and there's my math, and there's a biblical math, a biblical math. And it's very precise, and it's very telling. It comes out in Luke chapter 15, the parables of lostness, where we have one out of 100, one out of ten, and one out of two. Hmm. It has to do with percentages. It's not a vague number. We, uh, Jane and I went to Hiroshima uh, on our trip. We were in Japan for two weeks, and we really wanted to make a day trip to a uh, two-day trip excursion to Hiroshima, which should ring a bell in your historical brain. And that was where, on August 6, 1945, the world entered the atomic age when uh, the uh, allies, the United States, dropped the first atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima. It was a very haunting and daunting experience. Very educational, a little depressing, very um, eye-opening. And um, they had things like, you know, they have text panels in the museum and everywhere. And they said on that day, 70 th about sev approximately 70,000 people died on that day. And by December of 1945, and f approximately 140,000 people died. And you know what from? From the burns or from radiation, from radiation. So within the close of the year in a few months, approximately 140,000 people died. It's interesting to me that God does not use words like not much money in the bank or approximately this many victims. God is very precise and each, as Peter would say, integer, each number is important. The Pharisees had come to Jesus because they were miffed and they got to the word, to, they were miffed about the fact that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and, and even the Bible puts in quotes the word sinners. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Human beings who did not fit the acceptable category in the eyes of religious people. Do we do that? Do you do that? Do I do that? Were there human beings out there, specific individual people who have souls, but in my view, who are not acceptable to be under the umbrella of God's grace? 
I could think of examples and so can you, okay? But if you stop to think about it, there are other individuals who are under God's grace who are no more acceptable. And that's you and that's me. Because God has singled you out. It's, it implies in John chapter 10, the traditional good shepherd gospel lesson that God has elected his sheep from eternity. He has elected you one by one to be in his flock, to recognize his voice, and to follow him into the eternity of heaven. Now, sometimes we're not very good at it. Hmm? We're not very good at it. We skip hearing his voice in church. We skip the assurance of forgiveness in the sacraments. We get miffed at the pastor or somebody in the church, and we walk off for six months, things like that. But God goes out of his way because he has elected you to keep you in the flock and to make sure you get the reward he has designed for you. But this parable can also be used um, to expand our attitudes where we are more godlike and we are more Christ-like in reaching out to tax collectors and sinners. People whom we have the tendency to say they're, they're not worthy of our church. I'm going to uh, jump the gun and, and sub submit some demographics that I think we have trouble with. We're getting a better about the divorce, but I still has have a sense that we find church-going people kind of shun divorced people. Oh, she couldn't keep her marriage together. Oh, he left his wife for another woman. And it's like, they're not worthy of God's grace. Jesus wouldn't say that. Jesus would leave the 99 who keep their marriages together and go out and look for that divorcee and say, you know, your sins are forgiven too. Please come into my family. I love you. I have forgotten that episode in your life. I know I'll get in trouble for this one, but I'm going to say it, the gay and lesbian community. Last time I heard, they're still human beings. They're still human beings. Now their behavior appalls some of us, and some of you know your Bibles well enough to go to book, chapter, and verse and show me and tell me that their behavior is unacceptable. Well, my behavior and your behavior is unacceptable too the way we disobey God's commands, run people down. Jesus, you would find Jesus, I believe, it says, eating with tax collectors and sinners because the umbrella of God's grace for the good shepherd is quite broad. A couple months ago, at your encouragement, I went to um, help me out. You have strong ties with it. You make a contribution every year. The um, hope. The abortion, the anti-abortion, what's that called? Real hope? Help me out. Real hope crisis center. You'll hear from me from the pulpit say abortion is wrong. Thou shalt not kill. That includes the unborn. And I'll say it, and I'll mean it. I think it's God's word. But there are women out there and men who have been complicit with it say let's get rid of the baby, and they do. And then uh, t for me, they're... They're a tax collector and sinner. But you'll find Jesus eating with them. The one that is marginalized. Shouldn't we be doing that? Shouldn't Gary be doing that? Dropping those judgmental categories. I'm going to accelerate again. I want you to do your homework for this week. It's a little bit like what I laid upon you a couple weeks ago. Is to pick a demographic. Pick a demographic. That is, that is um, not often seen in the church, not enjoying the grace of, of the grace of God, which comes in the gospel and the sacraments, and hopefully the love in our hearts. I want you to pick a demographic. So what I mean is, um, pick the gay community, or the or the abortion recovery community, or an addiction community. Mm -hmm. Or individual, you don't have to do the whole city, or an individual, or what else did I say? 
do the do the enact as a church that's a demographic you know what we have 50 people this morning we have 150 on the rolls pick that demographic well, you don't have to do them all pick one you know and go out and I have one already and for some reason God has put Asians in my life. I think it came when Jane was the director of International Friendship House at Arizona State University for three years. Um, and um, internationals from all over the world, but mostly from China and Asia, okay? And, and um, it seems to me that's my demographic. And, and do your best to show them God's love and acceptance, eat with them. Take them out to lunch like Jesus did and tell them how much you care about them and you want them so much to come back to God's flock because we need you. We need you. And it'll make us happy. There's no greater joy in heaven than one sinner who repents. Here's my own math one. Remember the story, Lucas, did you, did Grandma read you the story? Oh, he's, he's sleepy. <laughs> sleepy. The, f the, the farmer, the goose, the fox, and the bag of beans. A farmer had a goose, a fox, and a bag of beans. He came to a river. He wanted all three to get across, but he knew he couldn't leave the fox with the chicken and he knew he couldn't leave the, the, not chicken, the goose, and he couldn't leave the goose alone with a bag of beans. Okay, how is he going to get him across the river, and what's the least number of trips that he would take? It's the math. Remember that one? Let me help you out. He gets in a boat, and he takes the goose with him. He goes across the river. He leaves the goose on that side of the river. He goes back in the boat. That's one trip. He goes back in the boat to the other side, and he, that's two trips, and he takes either the fox or the bag of beans over to cross the river. Let's say he takes the bag of beans, right? Takes the bag of beans, trip number three, over to where the goose is, brings the goose back. That's four, all right? He takes the fox, because the fox and the goose can't be together alone, okay? He takes the fox over on trip number five, where the bag of beans is. He goes back over by himself, six, and he brings the goose over. The answer is seven. That's my kind of math. Are you impressed? I don't want you to remember Peter's math, and I don't want you to remember Pastor's math. I want you to remember the math of Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 on this Good Shepherd Sunday, which lands on the Easter season where we are assured of eternal life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and convinced that our sins are forgiven and paradise is reopened. I want you and myself to find the one lost sheep and somehow convey to them we miss you and be sincere about it. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding and the joy of salvation. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Be and abide with you now and forever. Amen.